This is March. Texas basketball tournament hopes are walking on a tightrope and football season is here. Kind of. We'll hit on all cylinders when we come back on College Press Box. Hi, welcome to College Press Box. I'm Steve Helwick alongside Eric Goodman. I hope all of you are adjusted to daylight saving time and are enjoying your Monday night. I believe the current date is March 11th, so that means we have some March Madness brewing up on the hardwood. That's right, Steve. On Saturday, Texas basketball had one last chance to improve its regular season and finish 500 in Big 12 play. This one coming at home against a struggling TCU team. Could the Horns handle the, flog the Frogs on senior night? Let's go to the highlights. Kerwin Roach didn't get to enjoy too much of his senior night, and neither did his teammates or coach or anyone in the Irwin Center for that matter. Jackson Hayes here, going to try to keep Texas closed with a nice little sky hook. But then on the other end, we still got Coleman stopping the bleeding here with a three. And then on the other end, Desmond Bain. That's two of his 34 points. The Horns could not contain him. Elijah Mitre Long, he was on the scoreboard. Couldn't really do anything on defense, though. And this was JT Miller doing it at one end, and then here on the other, JT Miller. Yeah, you get that out of town. T TCU giving it everything, giving Texas everything it can handle. Jackson Hayes, well, we can still show dunks from him. And then Bain, yeah, making the Irwin Center look like Heinz Field. Jackson Hayes again with a nice dunk there, but not a good night for Texas as they lose 69-56. to TSTV Sports' own Matt Marinchak was at the Frank Irwin Center on Saturday to recap Texas's brutal defeat to Desmond Bain and the TCU Horned Frogs. Last Saturday, the Texas Longhorns took on the TCU Horned Frogs in Texas' senior night. Senior night is typically the night the teams go all out to get the win for their seniors. But in this case, TCU out-hustled, out-rebounded, and flat-out outplayed the Longhorns. Senior day, you want to do everything you can to win for your seniors. Um, but uh, if you go over the line of, uh, you know, I don't want to mess up for my seniors, I don't want to lose the game for my seniors, I, I don't want to make a mistake for my seniors, then, uh, you know, you see what you saw today. This loss was extremely hard on the players, but it seemed to be the hardest on senior Dylan Ostakowski. Yeah, definitely not the way we wanted to finish out. Uh, our regular season. We feel like we got a lot of basketball left to play, so we got to make a decision on how we want to finish out for a year. You know, we just didn't have that, that spark, that, that you know, sense of urgency, energy that we usually play with. After coming up short in a must-win game, the Texas Longhorns' playoff hopes and future are now in question. We'll see. I mean, we're going to find out in Kansas City. So, I mean, we obviously have to play a lot better than we played today, but we're going to see. Despite this loss, Freshman Courtney Ramey looks to the future to get this team back on track. Um, today was just a tough one for us, but our model now is just beat our next opponent, and our next opponent I think is Kansas. So we got to um, prepare for Kansas and just focus on Kansas. Can't really focus on NCAA, this, this, and that. Then if we lose focus on the main goal, it's just win the, ne the next game. From the drum, I'm Matt Marinchek, TSTV Sports. For more on Texas basketball, we welcome in Jake Herman, no relation to Tom, into the studio. Now, the Longhorns have been dominant at home in Big 12 play. They entered Saturday 7-2 and two before TCU came to town. They've been good against conference opponents there. But what caused Texas to suffer such a brutal defeat, 13 points, and that was even generous uh, margin on the scoreboard at the end? Yeah, well, well, Steve, I think Saturday's game was an example of some of Texas's season-long uh, weaknesses sort of coming home to roost. Uh, the first of those would be their struggles on the defensive glass. Texas is a last place team in the Big 12 when it comes to defensive rebounding. On Saturday, TCU out-rebounded them by an 11 rebound margin. Texas could not secure any key defensive rebounds down the stretch. Now the second would be their inefficiency from beyond the arc. Texas attempts the most three-point shots per game in the Big 12, but only makes them at the seventh highest percentage. When you have days like Saturday when you're shooting four of 19 from outside the arc, that's just not gonna get it done. And the third is, on the flip side, a weak three-point defense. Texas gives up the highest three-point shooting percentage in the conference. TCU, you mentioned Desmond Bain going off for 34 points. That's because TCU shot 9 of 17 from three, most of which came from Desmond Bain on wide-open looks. 
Now, Shaka Smart, after the game, he said this is as disappointed as he's ever been. And through four seasons, he's 66 and 65, still yet to win a tournament game. So Texas fans are drawing the contrast to Rick Barnes, who made the tournament 16 of 17 seasons. What do you see as Shaka Smart's future in Austin, whether he makes the tournament or doesn't make it this year? Well, I think whether he makes a tournament or not this season, he'll be back next season. And if nothing else, that's a product of the fact that he's owed millions of dollars through the 2022 season. Um, now, the thing about Shaka Smart at this Texas program is that he's been a great recruiter. He's brought in first-round lottery pick talent year after year, but every year he seems to underachieve, especially in these close games. This season, some of Texas's final plays have been real head-scratchers for me. So Tex uh, Shaka Smart's seat is definitely hotter than it has been during his tenure. Now, Texas has for sure one game left, and that will be in the Big 12 tournament in Kansas City. They'll face a Kansas Jayhawks, who they've split the season series with one and one. Now, if Texas loses, they'd be trying to get the first ever team with 16 losses admitted. What do you see happening in Kansas City with the Longhorns? And is this an NCAA tournament team if they win, if they lose, regardless of what happens? Well, I, I think you hit on the nose. This is Texas's first NCAA tournament game, essentially, because Let's face it, I, I just don't see the Texas Longhorns being able to knock off Texas Tech in the second round, who's just playing on another level right now. So this Kansas team might be their last chance to improve their resume before the NCAA tournament. And I think it's actually a very winnable matchup for the Texas Longhorns. Uh, in the first game, Kansas won at home. LeGerald Vick shot the lights out. Jackson Hayes was a non-factor due to some early foul trouble. But in the second game, without LeGerald Vick to shoot three-point shots and with Jackson Hayes, post-presence, Texas was able to shut down Kansas's big man, Diedrich Lawson, and win by 10 points. Now, between LeGerald Vick being out and Kerwin Roach possibly returning to this Texas team, we're not sure that's a big X factor in this game. But Texas could pull the upset in this game. Now, Bill Self's teams are always dangerous, so I'm hesitant to just pick against them. But, I mean, Texas, is, they've got to be desperate here. If, if they don't win this game, you're looking at a 16-16 and 16 record, a 500 team. Now, I don't care what your strength of schedule is. I don't care how many quality wins you have. In Texas's case, they've been able to knock off some top quality opponents, such as North Carolina. But I, I don't care who you are. If you go 16-16, and 16, you're not making the NCAA tournament. So this, this might as well be their first playoff game. Mm -hmm. You are right. So much seems on the li line Thursday night with Texas situated right on the bubble. And... Anything can happen in March, it seems, and that is true for softball, too. So when we come back, we will talk about Texas Longhorns as they would go for a win against the Minnesota Golden Gophers this weekend. Hi, welcome back to College Press Box. Now, under first-year head coach Mike White, the Texas softball team has experienced quite a resurgence this season. But the Longhorns had a formidable open opponent travel down from the land of 1,000 Lakes this weekend. We have Justin Morris to analyze Texas's weekend series against Minnesota. This past weekend, the Texas softball team competed in the Longhorn Invitational hosted at McCombs Field. They played in a round-robin tournament against Texas Southern and Minnesota. On Friday night, the Longhorns and the Golden Gophers met for the first time since last year's regional tournament, when Minnesota beat Texas, putting an end to the Longhorns' run at the College World Series. The Horns are coming hot off a five-inning defeat over the Texas Southern Tigers and try to keep their home win streak alive against Minnesota. The Gophers started hot in the first inning, as Hope Brander got an RBI single down the middle, putting the Gophers up by one, and from then on, the game was a battle of the defenses. This included a monstrous catch from left fielder Reagan Hathaway. In the final inning, Minnesota scored three runs to solidify their lead. Miranda Ellis tried to help the Horns with a run, but it was not enough as the Gophers finished Friday with a win over the ninth-ranked Horns. This was only the fourth loss of the season so far for this Texas softball team. The Longhorns look to adjust as they inch closer to Big 12 Conference play. We're learning from every loss. We're learning from every win. We just got to keep going forward. Coach Spencer always says that you're, as long as you're going up, there's going to be bumps along the way going up, but as long as we're going up, then... Uh, we're doing what we need to do. The loss put an end to Texas's home win streak of 13 games. The Horns did have a good fan presence Friday, but a loud Golden Gopher crowd made the game just a bit more difficult for Texas. The tournament ended on Sunday night, putting Texas at 21 and 5 overall for the season. Experiencing the first home loss of his Texas career, Coach White talked about how the team needs to play up to the competition in every game. You know, it really comes down to what happened in that Minnesota game because it's, you know, that's that's a team that's going to be in the top 20 
I'm pretty sure, uh, you know, so we won't be able to play better against those better teams. The softball team looks to get past this tough weekend on Wednesday night as they face Texas A&M Corpus Christi. From Red McCombs Field, this is Justin Morris, TSTV Sports. Bailey Wald is with us to dig deeper into this resurgent Texas softball team. Bailey, the Longhorns had to battle back from their first home loss on Friday and ended up finishing the Longhorn Invitational a very respectable 3-2. and two. What did Mike's White, Mike White's team show you to lead, lead them to this resurgence? Well, that's right. Friday was their first home loss against Minnesota, and it was one of the two games that they were out hit, the only other game being against LSU, and they also lost that game. And in the same idea, Miranda Ellis allowed a lot more hits and runs on Friday. Even though she had 12 strikeouts, the team only had three hits Friday versus their 10 hits Saturday against Texas Southern. And Friday, three players struck out, where on Saturday, no one struck out. So clearly their main thing is that Saturday, they were hitting the ball so much more than they had done on Friday, and they were able to win that game Saturday against Texas Southern. So that's really what they need to keep doing. Yeah, and it's been, like we said, a resurgence season, season, Texas softball, under Mike White, making strides that we never expected. Who are they on the field? Who are they relying on? Who are they leaning on to get consistent production so far? One of their key players is freshman pitcher Shaylin O'Leary. She went 42 innings without an earned run and was the first ever Texas freshman pitcher to start the season 7-0. Saturday, she pitched six strikeouts, which is close to her game high of eight, and has had lots of games so far this season, allowing zero or only one run. And they have a lot of other strong pitchers they're relying on, Brooke Bollinger and Ariana Adams. And Mike White brought over four Oregon transfers, Shannon Rhodes, Mary Yakupo, one of the two catchers, Miranda Ellish, one of our pitchers with a high of 14 strikeouts this season, and an all-around player, Lauren Burke. So with all of those players, even though some of them are new to the team, they've really been leading this team well this season. Yeah, and so with that new talent, you put it alongside some of the underclassmen from last year and some previous years, even though those weren't successful years. This year, it's all clicking. So what are some realistic, expe realistic expectations we can have as we look towards the end of the season? Well, so far, they're number nine, and I think that that's something that's going to continue for the rest of the season. When you look at last season, at this point, they already weren't doing well as a team, but they're having such a strong season, and it's really because of Mike White and all of these new transfers. Just changing the players and the energy that this team has has really changed their dynamic, and I think that they're going to do really well. I know we have some time, but possibly hosting a regional and going far for the rest of the season, but definitely staying up in the top ten of the rankings where they've been so far this season. And if they stay there, then what a great start to the mm -hmm. Mike White tenure. And after the break, Texas is back, folks, on the football field, that is. Stick around. Box. Today marked the official start of the 2019 college football season with the beginning of spring practice. We got to see some new faces in the burnt orange like early enrollees to Gabriel Floyd and transfer Brew McCoy, along with plenty of familiar faces from last year's team fresh off a Sugar Bowl victory and a top 10 finish. So Steve, this is without question the most anticipated football season here at Texas in over a decade, but how should those players and coaches under Tom Herman feel as we start the spring session? It's time to get excited about Texas football, and I think the players should feel that way because they're on the upswing, and that was evident last on New Year's Day in New Orleans against Georgia when they won such a thrilling victory, 28-21, to and now it's time to get excited. And Tom Herman's system's clearly working. He has two bowl wins in two years, already brought them ahead of schedule to a New Year's Six win and a top-10 finish, so it's time for the players to buy into Tom Herman's system and set their sights on a Big 12 championship and maybe another top-10 finish. Yeah, it, it looks that way. I would, I would say the same. Um, but this is still a team that is going to have to replace eight starters on defense. Um, there's no obvious backup quarterback lined up with Shane Buchel transferring. Uh, so among those and perhaps others, what are the biggest questions that Tom Herman and his staff are going to have to address, especially starting this spring? You mentioned replacing eight guys on defense. And if you watch the NFL Combine, you see how valuable some of the players on this defense last year were. Charles Amenehu, Chris Boyd, and even linebacker Gary Johnson were some of the best players on this team last year. That was 
were the senior leaders of the defense, and now they're out going to produce in the NFL next year, and it's next man up. You have to get those young guys. You have to have the coaches develop new players, and that will be key because we saw last year Texas had a solid defense, and that was what was able to limit Georgia's rushing game and limit Georgia to really seven points in the Sugar Bowl until the final minutes of the game. So I guess then the big question is, uh, as it stands, um, do you expect Texas, Texas to pick up right where they left off at the end of this season come September? Absolutely. Expectations is high are high. Maryland is not on the schedule. True. And I think this is the year Texas can win the Big 12. If you look at Oklahoma, I don't know about Jalen Hurts. I know he was behind some successful Alabama teams, but he never... He's not the Kyler Murray or Baker Mayfield quarterback the Sooners have had that has beaten Texas in past years. So I think Texas should be entering this year as Big 12 favorites with such a great dynamic quarterback in Sam Ellinger, a coach in Tom Herman who knows how to win these big games as he's done time and time again. And I'm not going to shoot for the moon already, but I'm saying if the Longhorns can win the Big 12 college football playoff hopes, that's definitely in line considering they're in one of the four conferences that usually gets it considering the Pac-12 is always in disarray and has so much parity. So if you can win the Big 12, your odds of going to that are pretty good. All you have to do is beat LSU in non-conference. I agree. That's a tough game, but you're right. It's not, for the first time, we can say Texas in the college football playoff, and it's not ironic to say that. It's actually mm -hmm. a legitimate possibility. Uh, but when we come back, women's basketball and Texas baseball face some tough tests. Stick around. Hi, now we return to College Press Box from the natatorium to the tennis courts. Let's round up this past week for the rest of Texas sports. Now we're talking championships. Three Longhorns men's divers will compete for the NCAA Swimming and Diving Championships later this spring. The three divers, Grayson Campbell, Jordan Windle, and Jake Cornish, have now combined for seven championship appearances in their ten years as Longhorns. Also, the number two ranked women's swimming team qualified 10 swimmers for the NCAA championships. Among those are Joanna Evans, Evie Pfeiffer, and Grace Ariola, who will each compete in three events at the championships. This past Friday, the number 16 women's tennis team defeated number 17 Florida State 4 to 1. The Longhorns received singles victories from sophomores Bohanna Markovic and Fernanda Lebrana, senior Katie Paluta, and junior Anya Tarati. Also, the team improved to 16 0 all time in dual match play at the Texas Tennis Center. The Longhorns host number 23 Pepperdine this Saturday. And once again, the number three men's tennis team remains one of the country's elite programs. On Sunday, the Longhorns ran the Wolfpack right out of Austin, sweeping NC State 6 0. Junior Yuya Ito came back down 2-0 in the, for his first set to defeat NC State's Igor Savaljic and clinch the victory for the Longhorns. Texas improved to 14-1 with a dominant win, but the Longhorns faced the only team that bested them this year later this week, number one Ohio State in Austin on Thursday. Huge matchup on the tennis court, uh, and after a dominant sweep of LSU on the diamond last weekend, and a Tuesday afternoon win against UTRGV, Texas baseball traveled to Palo Alto, California this weekend for a four-game series against the number six-ranked Stanford Cardinal. The Horns took game one in shutout fashion behind starting pitcher Ty Madden, who went seven scoreless innings. The next three games were all comfortable Stanford victories, bumming the Cardinal up to number four in the nation, but keeping the Horns steady at number 12. Next up for Texas is a matchup tomorrow night against Texas Southern, followed by another really difficult series at home against number 11 Texas Tech. We discussed some March Madness early in the show. Let's get back to that on the women's side. Karen Aston led the Texas Longhorns to a 23-9 finish entering the NCAA tournament. Now, the Longhorns reached the semifinals in the Big 12 tourney in Oklahoma City this past weekend. They defeated TCU by two points on Saturday before losing 75-69 to to the number 19-ranked Iowa State Cyclones on Sunday. Now, Selection Monday is a while out. It takes place next Monday on March 18th. That's when the Longhorns will find out what seed they will draw in what will be their fifth straight March Madness appearance. Now let's look ahead to the coming week in Longhorn sports. On Tuesday, Texas baseball takes on Texas Southern at 6.30, and also men's tennis versus Rice. On Wednesday, softball takes on Texas A&M Corpus Christi. 
on Thursday. There's that tennis matchup at the Texas Tennis Center against number one Ohio State. That's a three versus one matchup. And then men's basketball competes in the Big 12 championship starting Thursday. That's the game against Kansas that if they win, will continue and play further games. On Friday, softball is at the Tennessee Invitational. Baseball starts their series with Texas Tech. And then track and field is at the UTSA Invitational. And Steve, before we go real quickly, I'd like to wish my mom, Alethea, a happy birthday. She's here in studio with us. Mom, thank you for the support and all the love. And I would not be here hosting the esteemed College Press Box if it wasn't for you. So happy birthday, Mom. And special shout out to everyone in studio, Master Control, everyone on the production team that made this possible. We cannot thank you enough. And please follow TSTV Sports on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and every social media platform that exists out there on the internet. Thank you so much for tuning in tonight. I hope you have a great rest of your Monday night and enjoy your spring break coming up soon. Have a good one.